thanks very much. So one of the most positive things about the pandemic for me has been working with such inspirational colleagues um, who've given themselves so selflessly to such important work. Um, and as we all know, some of them have, have died. So um, it's really important that we take a moment to remember them. Thanks for joining us. So we've got an amazing cast again for the Journal Club webinar today. Uh, we've got Simon Carley, Professor of Emergency Medicine. We've also got another Professor of Emergency Medicine in Dan Horner joining us today, an expert in thrombosis and critical care medicine. We've got our two professors of medical virology in Pam Valerie and Paul Clapper. We've, we've got Charlie Raynard, who you'll know is an NIHR doctoral research fellow and emergency physician. And we're really pleased today to be joined by Salim Razai. Uh, so Salim, uh, thanks a lot for joining us. It's really great to have your expertise. You'll know Salim from Rebel EM. Good morning, thanks for having me. It's great to have international insights. So uh, we're really pleased that you could take the time out to join us. And I know that you've just finished a clinical shift and it's yeah. uh, four or five o'clock in the morning right now where you are. Yeah, I work till 1.30 in the morning my time and it's now five o'clock in the morning. So I, I got a good three hours of sleep. It was a nice power nap. Nothing, nothing like waking up for a journal club with you guys. <laughs> Well, thanks so much. And perhaps uh, as we go on, you can share some insights into what sort of things you're seeing at the moment. Would love to. So uh, let's move on and talk about how this is going to run. As usual, if we're able to join, we had a little technical hitch last week, and I'm not sure if we've solved it this week, but if you're able to join the webinar, please use the Q&A function to ask questions. Um, if you're not able to join the webinar, you can follow us live on YouTube, and that uh, link is out on Twitter. So you can still join us there um, and we'll try if we possibly can pick up on any, any, any questions that you might make in the comments. Uh, so this is what we're going to cover. We're going to cover a deep dive first of all, one paper that we're going to go through in detail for 10 minutes or so and then we're going to have some discussion around that and Dan Horn is going to talk about uh, a paper on thrombosis. And then we're going to go through five, actually this time it's four rapid fire papers where we're going to discuss them quickly. So we get through a lot of things to keep you up to date with the literature in this rapidly evolving field. And you can see everything at stemlinsblog.org. We, we post a fantastic uh, blog post and we'll update that with the details of today's webinar. So without further ado, let's get on to our first paper. And Dan Horner is going to talk to us about this one. It's from Helms et al, published in Intensive Care Medicine. Thanks, Rick. So um, just a tiny bit of background. I suppose uh, the listeners and you all on the panel will have seen that there's lots of studies coming through thick and fast reporting incidents of thrombotic complications in COVID-19. Uh, and uh, there seems to be an ongoing feeling in the clinical community that um, the clotting is a real issue with these patients. Those kind of papers and that feeling seems to be leading to changes in practice, which is a lot quicker than we would usually uh, practice evidence-based medicine and so I, I think it's right that we go back and have a look at some of these and we critically appraise them and, and work out whether they should be influencing our direct clinical care. This is one of the better ones uh, from Helms et al. So it's a, it's a multi-centre prospective observational cohort study um, uh, and what they've done is they've taken a, a consecutive um, sample of severe COVID-19 patients admitted to an intensive care unit uh, and they followed them all up to record their risk of thrombotic complications. Rather than just reporting their individual data, uh, in addition the authors here have um, used propensity score matching to compare the rate of thrombotic complications in COVID patients with those of another ARDS cohort. So a balanced group within an observational cohort study if you like, which is interesting and we'll perhaps come on to that. Uh, this is authored by the Crick's Trigger Set Group, uh, who have published a little bit on sepsis. They're a sepsis research collaborative in France. Um, so interesting that they've turned their attention to thrombosis. Uh, and just to go through the methods a little bit. So, you know, we, we say prospective observational cohort. What that really means is that they, they set up the idea uh, to recruit every patient coming through their ICU or their ICUs. Uh, with severe COVID-19 and, and follow them. But actually, of course, they are going backwards to look at incidence data. Uh, there's no controlling within this study at all. So patients just received routine clinical care at the discretion of physicians. So I think as you put in the methods, you could argue that it's a bit retrospective. We're, we're looking back for outcomes, um, but they would suggest that the patients are recruited consecutively and, and prospectively. They say it's multi-center. Uh, it's across four intensive care units in France. Actually, that, that's within two 
uh, sites uh, and it's within one hospital trust. So I, I struggled to unpick that a bit from the paper, but I suspect it's like Manchester Foundation Trust where you guys have multiple sites across the area. But I think it's important for us to acknowledge that, you know, this isn't five different hospitals doing different things. This is probably one organization with different sites. So multi-center, you know, again, um, raises a few eyebrows. Um, they look for a 28 day sample so every patient admitted to their intensive care unit over a month uh, and they followed up uh, up to seven days after their last admission so every patient has at least seven days to follow up but seven days is not a long time when you're looking at thrombotic complications and more importantly when you're looking for hemorrhagic complications from the treatment provided so that's important to bear in mind all patients receive standard care as directed by clinicians what does that mean uh, well, it's completely uncontrolled, so it means that the intensivists could do whatever they want to these patients. Uh, just a few things from the paper that I picked out this morning. Um, all these patients were getting daily D-dimers, which is interesting, you know, whether that influenced management, you know, that, that's, uh, that's for discussion. Um, in terms of whether these patients got thromboprophylaxis, which has been a, an ongoing question, 70% of them were receiving thromboprophylaxis at a reasonable dose and 30% were on therapeutic dose anticoagulation. So 30% of this cohort were, were completely anticoagulated. And again, that was at clinician discretion. And then if you look through what was happening to the patients, some of them were getting inhaled nitric, some of them were being proned. They've got ECMO within this center, so they have a, a number of patients on ECMO. So, you know, fairly sick, fairly realistic patient group. Uh, and then they took this non-COVID ARDS cohort um, as the observational propensity score matched group. Uh, so we'll come on to that. They chose a primary endpoint of any thrombotic complication uh, and by that they mean any diagnosis of PEDVT but also any clotting within a, a haemofilter circuit, any problems with ECMO, uh, any heart attacks, any strokes, any mesenteric ischemia uh, and any acute arterial ischemia. So uh, that's quite a large and broad composite outcome and I want to come on to that later. Patients were also investigated for VT at clinical discretion which is interesting. So we're talking a lot about this at the moment. Um, and so it's in everyone's consciousness. Uh, so does that mean that the bar is lowered in terms of who you image and is that important? I think it probably is. But to come on to the results briefly, 150 patients uh, consecutively admitted to this hospital during the time period. Uh, and a fairly realistic demographic. So 80% male patients, uh, median age of 63. And they had a baseline PF ratio of 125 millimeters of mercury, so that's the PaO2 uh, divided by the fraction of inspired oxygen these patients are receiving. It's a fairly good marker uh, and it's part of the Berlin definition for ARDS. Uh, less than 150 would be defined as severe ARDS. So, you know, that's a, a marker to suggest these patients were sick and 100% of them were ventilated mechanically. They report some mortality data, but as Simon, I think, will come on to in the JAMA paper later, we should probably be really conservative about how we interpret this uh, because 70 percent of their patients in this study were still on the icu still being ventilated at the time they report these findings so whilst they're reporting mortality it's in a really select group uh, and they haven't got the data really to, to produce any kind of, of mortality statistic that we can that we can use in our practice or we can interpret in terms of their primary outcome then so they report 64 thrombotic episodes which is a lot in a group of 150 patients. You know, they report that as 43% uh, of these patients getting uh, thrombosis, just as raw statistics. But if we look at the composite outcome, we can kind of drill down as to what that actually means. So they found 25 PEs uh, and they were split into location of PE. So they had a number of segmental and subsegmental PEs um, in those numbers. They had three DBTs four strokes, 28 haemofilter circuits that clotted, uh, three issues with uh, ECMO, uh, an acute limb ischemia and uh, an acute mesenteric ischemic event. So lots of different things that you wouldn't necessarily mix together as a composite outcome when you're looking at uh, uh, PE specifically, because you know what are we interested in as clinicians? We're interested in whether these patients should receive early investigation and or treatment for life-threatening pulmonary embolism, aren't we? Uh, if we? If we include extracorporeal circuit clotting in that, then uh, you know, there are lots of ways of dealing with that. Uh, heparinization of the local circuit, for instance, or using citrate and increased doses of that, you don't necessarily need to therapeutically anticoagulate the patients themselves to reduce the risk of extracorporeal circuit clotting. So you know, whether it's right to lump it all together as a composite outcome, I'm not so sure it is. And they conclude from this paper, having uh, performed some propensity score matching and, and balancing the risk of PEs against the match cohort of, uh, of 
non-COVID-19 ARDS patients, that there's more PEs overall uh, in their COVID-19 group and that the odds ratio is increased with COVID-19. I mean, if you look at the results on Rick's slide there, you'll see the lower margin of the confidence interval is 1.1. So we again, haven't really got certainty about whether this risk is increased, but they seem to feel that the, the suggestion is of a risk increase. And so their conclusion is for higher anticoagulation targets uh, and more robust therapeutic anticoagulation for, for all COVID-19 patients. And I think there are a number of concerns with that kind of conclusion or the, or the leading title of this kind of study, um, which we'll go on to now uh, for the discussion, if we've got time, Rick. Yeah, plenty of time, Dan. Thanks for that. That's great. Uh, so really interesting paper. Uh, Simon's come up with a point there in the chat yeah. box. I don't know, Simon, do you want to make that point live? Can do. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yep. Fine. So it was just that the, I thought the, the PE rate was actually quite low in the control group. And clearly they haven't applied the test to both equitably between the two groups, have they? They've chosen whether or not to investigate. And it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy that if you think these patients have got a high incidence of thrombosis, you're more likely to look for it. Yeah. Um, and as you said, you know, the, the, the composite endpoint is quite, quite remarkable. But there was a difference between the PE rate, was it 11.7% versus 2.1%? But in your experience, do you think that's quite a low PE rate for ICU patients on ventilators? Um, uh, again, I think it depends how hard you look for it, Simon. Uh, uh, there are previous studies that suggest uh, a PA within the general critical care population of around 2%. Um, so, you know, arguably that's not an unreasonable level. Uh, and when you get to severe ARDS, then there's a bit of reluctance to take people for scan, you know, depending on where your scanner is, you know, a reluctance to expose patients to the risks of inter-hospital transfer. So, uh, you know, how much we detect and how much there is, uh, I think is always a balance. But just to pick up on your point about um, looking how hard we look for this disease, I think, you know, that, that really comes to the fore in this paper. So 150 patients, the CTPA imaging was performed in 100 of those patients. So two thirds of patients are getting CTPA imaging, which is fascinating, isn't it? And uh, I think you can call that, you know, outcome bias or ascertainment bias, but I prefer to call it field of dreams bias. Charlie, have you seen uh, have you seen Field of Dreams with Kevin Costner? I haven't actually. You haven't, of course, you haven't. You're too young. Far too yeah. young. Um, but you know, I'm sure all the uh, grey-haired people on the panel remember. You know, if you build it, they will come. If you look for it, you will find it in critical care patients, uh, and that's that's absolutely true of PE and DVT. You know, there's loads of screening studies of critical care populations where you'll do daily duplex sonography and you'll have DVT rates of 20, 25% if you look for it. You know, if you look for clinical and relevant DVT, it's more like one to 2%. Uh, and in this population, you know, another interesting fact is that they only picked up a couple of DVTs within 150 patients, but they scanned a lot of lungs. And so they found a lot of subsegmental, segmental low bar clots. Uh, and whether we would see those in a population that we routinely screened in critical care, I think we would see a lot more than is reported in the standard prevalence. So do you and I also picked up on the fact that they use this propensity score matching. And uh, so you can see why they do that, because you've got two very unmatched populations. And so the propensity score matching tries to pick out patients who um, are very evenly matched in terms of the baseline characteristics. So you get rid of the confounders. So you do that, for example, when uh, you have an observational cohort that got two different treatments and you want to look at the outcome, but the treatment wasn't the same randomly. So your propensity score matched them to even out the uh, imbalances in baseline characteristics. But here it was slightly different using propensity score matching because you've got a historical cohort and a current cohort. So um, I wasn't quite sure about that. I thought they, they tried to even it out by doing that, which is, which is a reasonable thing to do, but I wasn't uh, totally sure that, you know, you, we can necessarily trust that with these cohorts because you still, certainly still can't uh, um, adjust for the, the time elements. And then you still look, even after, after propensity score matching, there was an imbalance, it looked like, it only get reached statistical significance, but in a proportion of patients who were on ECMO, for example, which is a big confounder. Yeah, no, I agree, Rick. And I, I picked this paper because they've had a go at propensity score matching, you know, they've tried to control uh, an uncontrolled observational uh, piece of work, but um, but it, it's not without its issues. And propensity score matching in general doesn't really account for unknown confounders, does it? You know, it only takes into account known variables. Uh, and then in addition, it, it's supposed to be used in large observational data sets. Uh, and this is 150 patients, you know, uh, and when you apply the propensity score matching, I think you're down to 77 with COVID-19, aren't you? So lots of, you know, it, it's a reasonable thing to attempt to do. 
but you know should it lead to definitive conclusions that there's a high risk of thrombosis and that we should be looking at higher anticoagulation targets i'm not sure it should because there's no um assessment of bleeding risk in this cohort and these patients you know we don't know anything about who's going to have serious intracranial or major bleeding when we give them three months of anticoagulation for a subsegmental or a segmental PE that we've picked up incidentally because we're looking very hard for them so there's no balance of risk benefit within this kind of work which is why I think these conclusions about the high risk and the need to act are perhaps a little early. Yeah, the bleeding risk wasn't uh, negligible either. It was 3.4% in the uh, yeah. COVID patients. So you've got this difficult balance because one reaction to this might be that we scan everybody, we pick up more VTEs, for example, and then we anticoagulate more patients. Salim, you've written about uh, thrombotic complications on uh, Rebel EM. So I'd be really interested to get your insights on, uh, on this paper. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting thing that we're starting to see because a lot of the initial data we were getting was just this kind of retrospectively going back and just telling us information about populations. And, you know, really that's what they did in this study. They just came up with the historical control, which I have issues with, like many of you, is just comparing apples to oranges. It's different times, you know, from 2014 to 2000, I think, uh, 15 when I was reading the paper they were comparing to it was uh, mostly bacterial sepsis patients I mean the populations weren't exactly the same so you know I applaud them for trying to do this propensity matching but I have issue with that the second thing I would say is you know I don't know if anybody looked down but if you actually go down to their tables and you look at their prophylactic dosing and you look at their low molecular weight heparin dosing, they just used a, a 4,000 international units per day. And I don't know how it is in the UK, but in the United States, we have a rather obese population. And so we're actually using weight-based um, 0.5 milligrams per kilo um, once a day. And so, you know, they don't have any information about the population's weight or BMI and yet 75% about, um, I'm rounding there, in both groups just got a prophylactic dose of 4,000. So I wonder how many of them were actually underdosed mm -hmm. uh, with their prophylactic low molecular weight heparin. And that's not really brought up in the paper either. I, I'm a clinician at the end of the day. And so I care about how we care for these patients and how we're dosing these things because they do matter. Um, and then the final thing I would say is that I agree with many of you that if you go searching for things, you're gonna find things. And although we found PEs in this study, what I found fascinating compared to previous studies is there's lots of talk about microthrombosis adding up over time, putting strain on the right ventricle. But actually in this study, when you look at it, there was actually very few subsegmental PEs. When you look at all the PEs that were there, there was 25 total PEs and only three of them were subsegmental. Um, the majority of them were actually in the primary branches uh, of the arteries. And so that's, you know, whether that's signal or something we should be acting on, I don't think this study tells us, you know, in order to find harm, you need much bigger studies that have more adverse events in order to say there's actually harm from something. I'm not advocating that we should be treating these people therapeutically, but, you know, certainly these patients that are getting admitted, we should have on therapeutic or a uh, I'm sorry, prophylactic anticoagulation, but I think it should be weight-based. And that's, that was one of the biggest issues I saw with the paper. I'd be interested to hear what others have to say. Can I? Um, that's, I think that's a really uh, important point for the take home message from this study as well, because um, people will want to know based on this, should we be giving therapeutic anticoagulation to everybody? So what, what do you say, Dan? So uh, Salim made some great points there. Um, we've been using weight adjusted um, prophylactic dosing for the last five years or so. And, uh, you know, the NHS has, has had a national um, agenda on prevention of hospital acquired thrombosis for the last decade. You know, it, it, we've been good at it. It's embedded in the NHS contracts. You know, trusts are uh, under strict reporting measures uh, and there is a good national approach to it. Um, and weight adjusted dosing it does really vary. And, and as Salim points out, you know, I mean, the American population is slightly different to the UK, but this is a disease that, that does seem to severely affect people with raised BMI, you know, my intensive care unit, you know, most of the patients look the same um, and they're all quite large. Uh, and so I think getting your weight adjusted dosing right is absolutely essential. And I think papers like this that report a kind of blanket dose for everyone are perhaps 
not getting you know, the basics right, uh, but then they're drawing conclusions um, that they, they shouldn't necessarily. Um, in terms of uh, you know, what we should be doing clinically, um, I think there's a really interesting question about you know, the, the kind of reach for heparin. We definitely want to do something in COVID-19, don't we? And, uh, and we keep being frustrated by the fact that we don't have any evidence-based therapies to use. So people are proposing double doses of, of, of prophylactic heparin per day. People are talking about therapeutic anticoagulation for everyone. We don't have any evidence that those things work. You know, and in this paper, 30% of patients were on treatment dose heparin and there were still clots and they were localized clots, weren't they? So the majority of the clots within this study were extracorporeal circuit clotting or they were within the pulmonary arterial tree. There weren't DVTs, you know, there weren't that many unusual site thromboses. So that doesn't necessarily tell you that, that the blood is overall sticky. What it tells you is that the lungs are very inflamed and the lungs are damaged. And we don't know if that microvascular thrombosis is an inflammatory pathology, which needs immunosuppression and or steroids or something to reduce inflammation, or it needs heparin to try and dissolve those clots. But you know, there's no real signal from this paper that therapeutic dosing is particularly helpful. So in terms of what we should be doing clinically, my reading from the literature and in practice at our trust is to concentrate on getting our weight adjusted prophylactic dosing right uh, and then to have uh, a reasonably low index of suspicion for further imaging to look for PE and to look for DVT. And then we balance the risk in an individual patient. You know, if we find a large PE, then of course the risks uh, of anticoagulation are justified for the treatment of that. But if we find a small one in the context of inflamed, horrible lung, then there's no DVT anywhere else. Sometimes we'll keep those people on prophylactic dosing. You know, it really depends. You, I think applying a blanket policy to these patients runs the risk of doing more harm than good. And we won't know about that for several months, which is why I would urge caution with it. So Dan, we should move on in the next couple of minutes, but we have a couple of points here in the chat box. So uh, one from Peter uh, Kilgore says that the evidence seems to only apply to patients with severe ARDS in ATU, but are yeah. there any data on uh, thromboembolic complications um, in the uh, COVID-19 cohort in general admissions? Yeah, so it's a really good question from Pete. Um, I haven't seen any good data on this. Um, I, we have looked locally. Um, so we have a, a way of kind of getting our VT positive reports back very quickly. Uh, and our rate of PE in admitted patients is no higher than it ever has been really. Um, and uh, we haven't seen that many patients escalate or decompensate. So I'd encourage everyone to look at their own local data, but I haven't seen any good papers that would justify enhanced dosing in medical inpatients admitted to yeah. hospital. And of course, that's really relevant for emergency medicine, isn't it? You know, again, we want to do things when people are coming in. I think some people are itching to start prescribing higher rates of thromboprophylaxis just because they feel like it'd be something positive to do. But I don't think we have any data to support that at all. Yeah, and if I could just add one more thing to that, Dan, you know, pre-COVID, we were, when we admit patients to a general ward or to the ICU, doesn't matter, they get weight-based uh, prophylaxis. I mean, that's just what we do in the United States, at least. And so I don't think you're advocating for anything different other than just let's continue the basics and let's do it right and let's do it weight-based. I think, you know, whether using D-dimer cutoffs or going for what people are calling intermediate dosing is yet to be seen. We, we just don't have the evidence for it. And I think at a, at a bare minimum, let's at least just get the basics right. Yeah, I'd agree, Slim. Worth also mentioning that whilst it's common practice in the UK and it sounds as if it's in, with you in the US, it's not common practice in some parts of the world where I think some of the rates of prophylaxis are down below 20%. So there are potentially lessons that people could take that because I think it's pretty reasonable to give prophylaxis to everybody you admit. Yeah, excellent point. And so um, thanks for that discussion. Really useful. Nice take home message. Let's not overreact. Let's carry on with good practice of prophylaxis for our patients uh, with COVID-19. So moving on, we're going to go to the rapid fire round and we've got four papers that we're going to cover um, quickly for you. They're going to give you a survey of some of the most relevant literature in this area. And we're going to start by going to Salim for one of the most topical issues around COVID-19 at the moment, self-proning. Were you guys not putting people on their stomachs before COVID-19? You just weren't laying patients on their stomachs? It's new to me. We were never doing it before COVID. <laughs> um, 
So this is a, a fascinating paper. It's not in terms of methodology, one of the most robust, but I think it's, I think of it as more of a proof of concept paper. And this is by uh, Nick Caputo, Ruben Strayer, and Rick Levitan, or Rich Levitan, excuse me. And the title of the paper is Early Self-Proning and Awake Non-Innovated Patients in the Emergency Department, a Single EDs Experience during the, the COVID-19 pandemic in academic emergency medicine. And this was just published on April 22nd. So it's fairly recent. And the clinical question they were trying to answer is, does awake self-proning improve oxygen saturation? Now, this was a prospective observational trial. It was a convenient sample, which we can talk about uh, when we do our panel discussion. It was adult patients who presented to the emergency department with an oxygen saturation of less than 90%. Um, and their study protocol was basically patients arrive, they measured a spot oxygen saturation. They then place some type of supplemental oxygen on them, whether that was nasal cannula or non rebreather. And then they measured their oxygen saturation and then they awake prone them where they actually had them lay on their stomachs while they were getting the supplemental oxygen, waited five minutes, and then they checked their oxygen saturation. Now, important exclusions here, uh, people who are DNR, DNI, so do not resuscitate orders were excluded. Patients who were cardiac arrest were excluded. And then interestingly, they excluded all patients on non-invasive ventilation, which we can talk about from a clinical standpoint, why I think that's a good idea. And then anybody intubated pre-hospital was also excluded. So 50 total patients. The initial median oxygen saturation on arrival was 80% in this convenient sample. Once they placed them on nasal cannula or non rebreather, that oxygen saturation came up to about 84%. And then when they put them on their stomachs, that oxygen saturation came up to 94%. And that was, by the way, their primary outcome was to see what their median oxygen saturation would be with all these interventions. Now, I think it's important to talk about from a clinical standpoint, when you look at their secondary outcomes, which is basically did proning fail? And it did fail in 13 patients out of the 50, which is about 26%. So you can look at this one of two ways. One in four are gonna fail, whether you do this or not, or three in four are not going on the ventilator. What we don't know is they followed these people for about 24 hours. So we don't know longer term, if you do this for two, three, four, five days, what that actually means. Interestingly, they do make one statement that says out to at least three days, Overall, 36% of the patients required intubation, which I think with some of the mortality rates we're seeing on ventilators, whether you want to call that association or causation, I think is a matter of debate because none of these are randomized clinical trials. Uh, I think keeping somebody off of a ventilator for now, again, doing the basics right is probably important. The other thing I would say is that even giving somebody two or three days off of a ventilator is also important. But the one thing I wanna emphasize here is we don't wanna innovate people who don't need it, but we also don't wanna wait so long and keep people off ventilators that do need it. And that's really the, the magic here is that I think the awake proning is showing us that you may buy yourself some time and you may give the patient some time to improve while they're going through this inflammatory process. The one last thing I wanna say, and then I'll open it up to everybody is that these patients start becoming very oxygen dependent. And it is really important that when you're asking them to prone themselves, that they don't get disconnected from their oxygen source because they will precipitously drop their oxygen saturations. And it's interesting that one of the subgroups that they excluded were patients on non-invasive ventilation. And I think that's probably a valid point because those are the ones that tend to get disconnected most commonly. So in the US at least, most of these patients were doing nasal cannula, non-rebreathers and high flow nasal cannula with a surgical mask over them uh, to kind of prevent aerosolization. And so I think this is just an interesting proof of concept. Awake proning was nothing I was doing before COVID-19 came to be. And uh, I think it's, a, it's fascinating when you look at the pathophysiology of why it works. Um, I don't think it's a panacea for everybody but I think that there will probably be some select patients that this will be very beneficial for. Thanks, Salim. So really interesting to have some evidence, even if it's kind of low level, not an RCT, just observational data, but some supportive evidence. Um, 
Simon's made the point that it just gives us time to plan in the ED as well. Can I... Yeah, um, so just a change in practice that we've seen when the patients, when we first started seeing these patients coming into the ED, there was a, a, a great rush to um, move towards intubation because there was a feeling that these patients are really, really sick. We've got to get on with it. And I think one of the things we've realized is that there is virtually always a significant amount of time to prepare and get yourself sorted and do it safely. Um, and I think this proning argument in the ED is another reason. So another tool in your kit that you can delay having to do something right now so that you can plan it. You're not having to do two intubations at the same time, you know, that kind of thing. So even just little things like that could be very relevant to the ED. Simon, if I could say one thing also, and this is something I've at least clinically been struggling with, and I'm sure many of you are as well, you know, there's just as much harm from ventilator uh, induced lung injury or VILI as there is patient self-inflicted lung injury, P. silly, which there's absolutely nothing silly about it, but you know, pulling too big a uh, negative pressure because of increased work of breathing can cause just as much harm as putting somebody on a ventilator. And the point I'm getting at is, is that I wonder if with proning these patients, if we're still allowing them to cause P. silly um, or we're just actually making some improvement. And at least in this small study, not high on the evidence-based medicine totem pole, it looks like many patients did avoid intubation. But I, I struggle with that. When is it time to pull the trigger? <laughs> so Dan, as a uh, youngling in uh, the ED space, if I came to you in our hypothetical scenario and I say, I've got a patient that quite sick, they're really hypoxic, but not responding very well to oxygen therapy. I'd like to prone them. Mm. What are you going to, what are you going to say to me? Uh, as an intensivist? As a mixed ED intensivist. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, the rationale for prone position, um, you can see why people are trying to apply it to awake patients. You know, we're talking about recruitment of dorsal lung lead, lung uh, alveoli, aren't we? We're talking about maximizing uh, blood supply to those ventilated areas so you reduce VQ mismatch uh, and you ameliorate shunt and and the, the other advantage to proning is secretion clearance and drainage so we're seeing a lot of very viscous secretions in these patients with severe COVID. They're hard to clear uh, and they lead to deep recruitment very quickly. So I think the rationale is reasonable. I suppose the kind of challenge to, to advocates of awake proning is, you know, how is this any different from sitting someone out in a chair or, you know, trying to get them into an erect posture? Because human beings are designed to stand up, aren't they? Or to sit up, you know, that, that's why we've got such better blood supply to the, the back of our lungs. Um, uh, and proning, I suppose, is an option, as Simon says, you know, it's part of our armamentarium. If someone is particularly sick and, and sitting them out worries you, but, but actually on intensive care and on high dependency, what we're doing with all of our patients on any kind of high oxygen requirement or, or non-invasive ventilation is we're trying to get them out as often as possible. Uh, and the evidence base for prone positioning in ventilated patients is is for long periods of time. You know, it's for 12 to 16 hours at a time to try and recruit those dorsal lung units uh, and provide a bit of stability. So that then when you turn people back supine, they are still recruited and they still uh, facilitate gas exchange. So the idea that you might prone someone for an hour in ED and then flip them back, I wonder if you're just making life hard for yourself. You know, it might be easier to sit them out in a chair uh, and then, you know, have that chair move to the next clinical area. Uh, I certainly wouldn't, class this as a treatment you know I think this is a, a time strategy that perhaps might buy you a little bit of time as Simon says I think it probably will improve the numbers but you know if we're if this is a journal club then we would say this you know an in transient increase in saturation is not necessarily a clinically relevant outcome is it there has been work done on awake proning in 2015 and earlier uh, and they usually show uh, a improved PF ratio during proning, but as soon as you put people back supine within an hour or so, it's back to where it was before. So what does this really do for your patient? You know, it probably buys you a bit of time for decision making, uh, but it's not really a, a treatment of sorts and it's not the answer. And if I could just add one more thing, I, I agree with Dan, this is a disease oriented outcome, not a patient oriented outcome. The other thing is, is it's a convenience sample, right? And we don't know yeah. why they pick these 50 patients over, let's say a different set of 50 patients. Maybe they, they kind of cherry pick these patients because they felt like they would be cooperative and could do awake proning. And this just doesn't generalize or apply to everybody. So I think that's the other thing to kind of keep in mind. And I know Nick and, and Rich and Ruben, and they're all great 
physicians. They do a lot uh, in the foam world. And I think this is great that we're starting to get higher level evidence, but, you know, I think take it with a grain of salt and um, yeah, I, I think it's not the highest level, but at least it's, it's better than some of the things we've had before this. Great. So really nice context there. Low risk intervention that might be worth trying, but lots of caveats, important caveats. Thanks to everyone for that one. So let's move on to the uh, next paper that we're going to look at, which um, is a diagnostic paper. So we hear lots, I think, in the media about um, testing strategies for COVID-19. And here we've got some clinical validation of uh, some antibody tests. So I'm just going to summarize those and then defer to uh, Professors Clapper and Valerie to tell us about their expert insights on this testing strategy. So this is a paper published in Resuscitation which uh, evaluated a new antibody test, IgG and IgM, for uh, COVID-19 antibodies. The test is provided by a company called All Test, which is a Chinese company. And um, it's, a, it's an immunochromatographic test. So that means it's like, a, one, like one of the lateral flow assays, where you, like a pregnancy test, where you read off positive or negative uh, on the strip. And they divided this, their cohort into three groups. They have a group of... Uh, um, 55 patients who had um, serum taken for other serological studies, but they were healthy controls. Then in group two, they had patients who had confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection, PCR positive. And then finally in group three, they had patients with pneumonia of unknown etiology who they prospectively recruited. They were uh, PCR negative, um, but then they were evaluated with the serologic test. And um, they, their reference standard was a PCR assay. So in group one, the healthy controls, everyone tested negative. So they imply that that's a specificity of 100%. In group two, who had positive PCR, they had a sensitivity of 47.3%. So less than half of the patients had, anti had antibodies on this test compared to the PCR, which doesn't sound very good. But in the late presenters who presented more than two weeks after their symptom onset, the sensitivity went up to 74%. So now you're, you're seeing that potentially if, you, if we've got late presenters coming in, maybe this could be a useful test because the sensitivity is increasing. Bear in mind that PCR is not perfect either. And that's where group three comes in because those were patients with pneumonia during the pandemic, but tested negative for PCR. And 89% of them had antibodies to SARS-CoV. So the bottom line here, the author's speculation is that perhaps we could have a combined testing strategy. PCR is going to miss some patients. Maybe the antibodies will come in and help us where we have patients who are PCR negative, but late presenters, and so they might have antibodies. So what do you make of that, uh, Pam and Paul? Who'd like to go first there? Yeah, the, there's huge interest, of course, in antibody testing at the moment. Um, as of yesterday, I could find 296 different tests for antibody have become available. And the interest particularly is, is to use this in population-based screening to try and track the spread of the virus, but also to, to try and define those who had had infection and whom it would be safe to say, you can return to work, you can, you can come out of lockdown. And yesterday, there was a very nice uh, commentary in The Lancet, which sort of tempered the enthusiasm for this, pointing out that just because you can detect antibodies to the virus does not mean that that antibody is protective. And therefore, we should be cautious about applying this in population-based screening. Here, they've tried to use it within an intensive care unit and use antibody testing intelligently. We have to accept that the current batch of antibody tests are not as specific and not as sensitive as we would like, and it is going to take time to get really good, really good uh, tests. But if you understand the limitations of the current tests, you can apply them intelligently, as this group have done. They first of all looked at the uh, samples which were taken from people before this virus ever appeared. So they, they looked in a group of, of serum samples which had been collected before November 2019, tested those, they, they were all negative. And that's good because in theory, this test could pick up antibody to coronaviruses which circulated before the appearance of SARS-2. They then looked at um, a group who were PCR positive in the intensive care unit 
and you've got differences in sensitivity of the test according to how long after the appearance of some of, of symptoms that you tested. Interestingly, if you looked at the distribution of patients with who, who were IgG positive or IgM positive, most of the patients were both IgG and IgM positive. Only two were actually IgM positive alone. Normally, we think of IgM antibodies as being the first antibody that we can detect in a virus infection. Here, it shows that the IgM testing is not very sensitive in this, this infection. As you move further on in the infection, you, you end up with a problem that the patients who are appearing in hospital, by the time they're appearing in hospital, already this, this problem that we discussed last week about the virus initially starts as an upper respiratory tract infection, and of course throat swabs will be, will be positive for the virus. By the time these more seriously ill patients arrive in, in, in the intensive care unit, the infection is actually in the lung. And it's very difficult to, to then sample from the lung because of the health and safety risks of doing bronchoscopy in these patients. You test them when the throat and the PCR is negative, yet they really do have SARS, two infection as shown by the third group that we tested who were PCR negative, who had pneumonia of unknown cause, test those and 86% of them were positive for antibody. Again, we have to be careful because the, the testing is better the longer after the onset of, of symptoms. So in patients who, who were looked at more than 14 days after the onset of, it, of symptoms, the test sensitivity for antibody improves, so it becomes a really, a really uh, more useful tool the longer after the onset of symptoms. If you balance the, 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 the inadequacies of the current testing and use this, this sort of testing um, intelligently, it can complement PCR testing in these patients, particularly for those serious patients who are ending in hospital. I thought a useful paper. Yeah, the the only thing I probably would add to that is I think you know as you say there's there's so many of these immunoassay tests coming out now, and what we really do need is some very good evaluations of them. I mean this is you know an interesting study, um, but there was a, a paper a couple of weeks ago by a Danish group I think wasn't there, um, where they looked at more immune immunoassays and compared them with each other, and in fact this one came out quite poorly in that. Um, you know, so I think it had 87% specificity in it, and the IgM was cross-reacting with other coronaviruses. So, um, you know, I, I think an immunoassay will appear and it, and it will be good. I'm not sure that this is necessarily it, but, but it's a nice study. There's been a lot of concern about regulation because the, the, the barriers to getting through the regulatory hurdles have been brought right down. But in fact, you're now getting CE marking, you're getting FDA approval, but with no clinical validation. Yeah. And, and the other problem is no standard as yet to evaluate these, these tests against. Normally for an immunoassay, we will have a, an international standard, a WHO standard, which allows us to compare compare the relative performance of individual tests and that's not yet available. I had a discussion yesterday with, with our, our uh, NIBSC which is the National Institutes of Biological Science who are responsible for developing these standards in the UK and they, they are working towards it but I think it's going to be a while before we get this comparative standard available to test out this myriad of, of antibody tests that appeared. We really need it to get the best one identified and used. So an important piece in the jigsaw, but long way to go yet. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And Simon's just made an interesting point that, that perhaps we can use you know, stored panel sera to find out when the disease actually arose when we do have a reliable test, which I think is a, is a, is a nice point. But um, there was, there's also been some very clever molecular studies published recently that suggest it sort of arose in around about September. But uh, yeah, it'll yeah. be interesting to look back at antibody data on that one. Great. Well, uh, let's move on to our next paper, which Simon's going to take us through, which is looking at uh, the characteristics of the disease in New York. Yeah, so this um, paper's got quite a lot of um, 
mileage on social media, a lot of um, chat. And I think I looked on the JAMA website this morning. It's been downloaded over a half a million times. So clearly this has had a wide impact. And I think it's, again, going to talk about the the world that we're living in at the moment and how evidence is sort of flying around and what the quality of, of that is. So just to give you a brief um, one about this, I think we're still struggling a little bit to have a, a really good picture about how COVID-19 looks. We've got people who've got their anecdotal experience, who've had some papers out of Italy, who've had some papers out of China, but actually understanding what it, it is and who it affects and what the prognosis is, is, is still uncertain because we just don't know. And we talked earlier about the fact that we're, we're now publishing papers like this one of 5,700 patients. And the majority of patients in this trial are actually still in hospital. They've not actually reached their outcome. So you see a big number like 5,700 and you think, oh, it's going to tell me everything. It doesn't. Anyway, I'll, I'll come to that. But essentially, this is an observational study looking at the experience from New York City, not the state, uh, looking at 12 hospitals there. Pretty busy hospitals. Some of them had over 1,000 admissions due to um, COVID-19. So, you know, there's a, there's a fair bit of experience here. To get into this paper, you had to have a positive PCR on nasopharyngeal aspirate, and we've already talked about that, that it may miss some patients, not the greatest of tests, and also some of the very severe patients, as we talked about last week, may not have a positive MPA anyway. So it's basically observational. I've gone through the records and they've found out the characteristics of the patient. So what did they find? Well, interestingly, um, you have to dig into this paper a little bit. So for instance, there's quite a high proportion of um, BME patients in this. Only 39% of the patients were white. But then if you go on to worldpopulationreview.com, you'll find out that New York City is 42.6% white and other ethnicities. So the, the mixture of the patients coming into the hospitals was very similar to what the New York City population was, according to that sort of data. The age range was an average, a median age, should I say, of 63, but with a range up to 107 years, which is quite remarkable. They're mostly male, which is what we've seen in other studies, at 61%. Um, there's a lot of hypertensives at 56%, um, obesity at 41%, the diabetes, diabetics 33%. And you think, well, those are really high levels of hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. But again, if you go digging into the stats, if you look at the US diabetes sites, you'll find that in patients age over 65, 26% uh, of them are diabetic anyway. And the incidence of hypertension in those age over 60 is 63%. So we've, and this is a big problem with these sort of observational studies where you don't have a good comparator group, is it doesn't necessarily tell you whether this is typical of that particular population or whether it is genuinely a, a risk factor for this sort of disease. And um, unsurprisingly, they still show that age is a major influence. So the most important age group is that age group between 50 and 60, the, the one that we really need to focus on um, for personal reasons. And the mortality there is 12.2%. Below that, it goes right down. Below 20, they had no deaths, but they also had very few cases. And the 50 to 60 age, 60 age group, partly because it's me, but also that's where the majority, sorry, that's the highest banding of patient numbers. That's where you seem to get the, the biggest surge in papers, in patients coming in. And uh, mortality in those aged 80 and 90 was over 60%. So age is clearly an issue, but whether it's an independent issue or whether it's linked to the other comorbidities, we don't know and we can't find out from this paper. When we start thinking about prognosis and, and who gets onto ICU and stuff, then you need to change that 5,700 number because 3,066 are still in hospital at the point when they published. So really, from now on, we're now thinking about the 2,634 who've either died or been discharged. And that gives us a little bit more information. It's a little bit more precise, I think. So of that group, um, about 14% of those admitted ended up on ICU. Um, and 12% of them got mechanically ventilated. Now, 81 of those had renal replacement therapy, which is only 3.2%. And I think that's interesting because that seems to be, in the UK certainly, we've been um, requiring uh, renal replacement therapy for more um, patients than that, is my understanding, uh, Dan, correct me. Um, but 22% of them had an, a, an AKI, which again, I think fits with what we're seeing, a lot of patients coming in dehydrated. And overall, of that 2,634, 21% died. So one in five mortality if you, if you require hospital admission. So this is a significant disease. For those who um, got through, 94% of them went straight home. So it sounds if you have your illness, but then you don't have a particularly long, prolonged post-ICU phase, which again is different to other diseases. 
the one controversy that came out of this is in the original abstract, I think they said there was an 88% mortality of patients who um, went to the ICU. But the problem with that is that that 88% is only the patients who've actually managed to get out of ICU or die. So we don't know what that number is yet. The way it's reported in the trial, almost certainly that number is going to come down as people continue their illness and either come home, survive ICU, they're a late survivor, they've just started an ICU and then get out. So don't hang on that 88% number. That's the one that's been banded all over Twitter, but it's almost certainly wrong. And it's not the experience in either Italy, China or in the UK. Finally, um, thing about ACE inhibitors, um, a special interest of mine. Again, in the 2,634, um, they did seem to see that um, there was an increased mortality amongst hypertensives on ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. And of course, this might be important because that's how the virus gets into cells. So if you're an ARB, 30% mortality, um, an ACE, 32.7% mortality. And if you're hypertensive and not on an ACE, 26. However, they've not done any assessment for confounders. The prescribing of these drugs is based on lots of different things, not just hypertension. So they're often um, prescribed in things like heart failure, which would be significant. And also there's ethnic differences in prescribing. So we don't use ACE inhibitors in Afro-Caribbean patients as a primary one. We use calcium channel blockers. So all sorts of things going here. Be very careful about interpreting the data, but some quite interesting stuff nonetheless. Right, so I'd like to come to Pamela and Paul for a comment on the uh, on why the virus might spread in such a, a dense urban area and a comment on, on that. And then there's a question from Ian, which I think might be good for uh, Celine to take, uh, given that it's about the US healthcare system. So Pam, um, could we ask you about this? Uh, you know, this is, New York is really badly hit by the virus. I mean, what are, the, um, what, what are your perspectives on, on this from a virology perspective, point of view? Well, I guess anywhere that you have got a, a dense population crowded together, you know, it's the reason we're social distancing, that the virus will spread much more easily. Um, you know, people living together in, in close contact, it's going to spread more easily. Um, you know, the US health system, I, I don't know, uh, I'll perhaps we'll come to that later in the next question, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's a, it's a transmission thing, isn't it? Oh, do I have to that? Yeah, I think, you know, the closer the contact, the more contacts you have during the day, the, the greater the risk of transmission. It's as, it's as simple as that. If you live in, a, in the wilds of Wyoming, maybe uh, you have less social contacts and less risk of transmission. And that might well explain, you know, the differential um, density of infection that we see in different centres around the world. It seems to be mainly the heaviest infection rate seems to be in in urban areas and i think it is simply because of this social interaction mm. you, you transmit the infection when you cough or you sneeze you transmit it on your hands and, and people become more infected yeah, i mean we know it lives on surfaces for quite a long time and uh, you know i guess your, your chances of walking through a door hand opening using a door handle that you know, 20 other people have touched in the last minute is much higher in New York than it is in Wyoming or somewhere. Great, thanks for that. Uh, let's go to this question from Ian Beardsell. Uh, is the data skewed by the fact that those attending the hospital are those with adequate health cover? Salim, you're on mute there. It's a good question. Am I coming across now? So, you know, I think you have to look at prevalence of disease in an area and how much a health system gets overwhelmed. And in New York, they just got absolutely crushed. And it wasn't people not having health coverage. It was just the sheer numbers of people coming in. And, you know, we talk about running out of ventilators and running out of resources, and that's all important. But the one thing you never hear anybody talking about is running out of staff. Mm -hmm. And... When you start getting overrun and caring for people in a suboptimal way, um, in hallways, without being on monitors, instead of maybe, you know, one nurse to three or four patients, you now have one nurse to like eight patients. It's going to dilute the quality of care through no fault of the people that are working in that facility. And so I think we need to take that with a grain of salt. I mean, this is being published during a time of an absolute pandemic and New York being the epicenter of that. And it doesn't really have anything to do with coverage. Uh, 
I think it just has to do with sheer volume and diluting the amount of critical care these patients can get because there's just not enough staff. They're all doing the best that they can, but this may be different than somewhere like San Antonio, where I live, where our prevalence of disease is very low. We've actually seen very low numbers of patients coming through our EDs, and, and maybe this will be a nice segue for the next paper, but we're seeing lots of delayed presentations of things now, pHs that I have never seen for DKA because people were scared to come in, uh, new onset heart failures because people had probably had their heart attacks a week prior, uh, stroke symptoms showing up three or four days after they had it. And so what I'm seeing is despite the volumes being lower, the acuity is much higher, but because I have a lower volume, I'm able to actually give the care that I need to to those patients. But it's, I'm a little worried about the messaging that's public health messaging that's going out to people. And I understand why we did it. And I don't want to get into politics, but I feel like we need to change our messaging a little bit and tell people that we're going to keep them safe and that we're going to take care of them. I, I'm worried about the collateral damage of non-COVID issues from people staying home. So um, I don't think this is because of lack of healthcare. I think it's because it's just the volume was so high in New York. Well, that is a really nice segue into our final paper, actually, because Charlie's going to talk to us about a paper that's something non-COVID in COVID time. So the decline in admissions for acute coronary syndromes uh, in patients in, um, uh, in Austria. So Charlie, we're a few minutes behind. I'm sorry about that, but um, we'll, so we will run a few minutes over to everyone who's joining. But uh, Charlie, could you take us through this paper? Absolutely. So this is a paper by um, Metzler et al. Apologies for the typo to Metzler et al. Um, it's a non-COVID COVID paper. Um, and what they did was they sent a survey out to all of the PCI centers in Austria. They covered the month of March and they said, how many patients are you admitting with acute coronary syndromes? It was very simple, but the benefit of that was it was very quick. And it was one of the earliest papers published on the side effects of this international treatment we've given to on a population level to COVID, this lockdown. They found that over from the first to the last uh, weeks of March, a 39.4% drop in admissions for acute coronary syndromes. That's massive. In terms of end stemmies, it went down from 132 to 67 admissions per week. Now, there are some important limitations with this, which are one, because it was so quick and simple, uh, they didn't adjust for anything. We don't know what normally happens in March. Does it drop off towards the end of March? That's unlikely, but it's a possibility we should remember. Um, and also there might have been system changes within the Austrian healthcare system, i.e. our PCI centres, have they upped their threshold for taking patients? Do patients get treated locally more often? We just don't know. But that being said, if we could do an adjusted analysis, I would be surprised if it could account for the entire 39.4%. Also, that headline reduction tallies with, has some face validity because it can be cross-referenced to the UK and to some of the things Salim was saying there. In the UK, the NHS England stats for um, total ED attendances in the month of March for last year compared to this year are down by 30%. Last year we had 2.17 million, this year 1.53. That's a huge drop um, and th what we're seeing here is the harm from the international lockdown treatment that we've done. We're not, I'm not saying that the lockdown was not necessary. The lockdown was very much necessary, but we must recognize that there are harms that we now need to try and minimize. Great. And we're, really, we're, seeing, we're starting to see um, some efforts to counter this now with the BHF, I think, having a campaign to try and get people to attend emergency departments with chest pain. And that seems like a really important public health message. So anecdotally from Manchester, this is supports what I've observed in terms of our reduction in other uh, admissions and attendances. Uh, Celine, you mentioned that you've had some really sick patients presenting late. Um, how do we get the message out there? You know, I think we just, we need to change our, our public messaging through whatever platforms we usually use. And I, I suspect it's going to be different in the UK and even in the United States, it, it'll be different based on regional and system availability and how you get those messages out. I know at our hospital system, 
We've been telling people that, you know, we are open, we will keep you safe. We have workflows to keep you separated from people with COVID. I mean, people would rather have heart attacks and die at home than come to the emergency department and catch COVID. I mean, that is, that is the public messaging most of us put out. And I'm not questioning the messaging. We, we needed some time to catch up with our testing and our PPE and uh, all those sorts of things. And I, I would argue that although not perfect, our testing is getting better, certainly better than it was six weeks ago. The PPE, I think most of us are figuring that out. There might be locations that are still having issues. And I think it's time that we, you know, this is a first step to moving forward. So I think it's whatever messaging system you use, you just need to let people know that you're gonna keep them safe and that we're here to help you. And if you think you're having a stroke or you think you're having a heart attack, don't wait, come to the emergency department because I worry about the long-term consequences, what I called the collateral, non-COVID-19 collateral damage that we're causing by the public messaging to stay home. Yeah. Can I chip in there, Rick, as well? Sure. So just to say, I mean, we've, we've had equally tragic anecdotal cases of people presenting late with completely treatable pathology. Uh, and I think quantifying the uh, degree of non-COVID related morbidity and mortality is going to be absolutely essential to make sure we learn the lessons from this pandemic. Um, you know, how do we kind of reframe the message about staying at home? That's really challenging, isn't it? I know that the Royal College of Emergency Medicine in the UK has done quite a lot of work trying to reassure people, suggest that the departments are open. You know, we are here, as Salim says, we have COVID and non-COVID streams, you know, we want people, but it's not really just clinicians, is it? There's a wider message from the ambulance services who have policies about who they will go to and who they won't go to. There's a, a message to primary care about who they will speak to on the phone rather than telephone triage and stay at home advice. There's a, and there's also a national political message, isn't there? Um, which I think needs to come because there was huge focus on that initially. Uh, you know, stay at home, protect the NHS, save lives. That message is still out there on a huge variety of media outlets. Uh, and, and reframing that message needs to be done by all of those partners, I think. There is an argument that's been said that the purpose of the lockdown, to some extent from a health service perspective, was to allow us to build capacity such that when we continue to have patients, as we almost certainly will, that we won't get overwhelmed. So the strict lockdown has allowed us to build and to practice and to resource and to get ready for what's still to come. I mean, I don't know what Pam and Paul think, but you know, my feeling is we're going to see a lot more cases and they, they will spike. They'll come up in different places. We'll have breakouts again. That's almost, it's, it's inevitable, isn't it, Pam? Uh, yeah, certainly, you know, that's what we're expecting. And one point I, I was going to make during the, the uh, New York paper is they, they did a limited panel of um, co-respiratory infections. Um, and it was quite low, though, I thought, 2% or 2.1%. But the next wave, we're probably going to have flu around as well. We're going to have other respiratory viruses around as well. So I think you know, the second wave's probably got a potential to be much more significant than this one. Paul? Can I make one more comment about the New York paper, if that's okay? I know we're kind of running over time a little bit. Uh, so I, I noticed that co-infection 2.1%. You know, the question is, is, you know, is it because of the time of year and we're just seeing less other less viral respiratory illnesses um, or was there just something else going on? But the point I wanted to make was uh, many places are using a triage protocol to decide who's a COVID and who's a non-COVID patient. And one of those questions, at least in the United States, is do you have fever and the one thing that I found fascinating in this paper is only 30% or 30.7% to be specific had fever. And the reason I mention this is that it's better to assume everyone has it than to put your weight in these triage protocols because they're going to miss a lot of people. And we're seeing what we call COVID plus syndromes here in the U.S. where we'll have little old ladies who fall down and break their hips with no respiratory symptoms, and then they get tested before they go to the OR, and guess what? They're COVID positive. Mm -hmm. And so I think it just, that was one little subtle message in this paper is that be very cautious how you're using triage protocols because you're going to miss people. You should just assume everybody has it. Yeah. yeah. And just to comment on the, the co-infections, of course, the laboratory services have been overwhelmed by this as well. 
and the rate of, of testing for other respiratory pathogens is likely to be lower than we normally see. So we may well have other circulating pathogens. This time of year, the, the amount of respiratory virus infection tends to decline. But you know, if, if, if the modeling is correct, that in, as, we, as we move into October, we may well see a second wave in, in, the, in the Northern hemisphere. And with that may come the surge in, in the usual surge in respiratory infections that we see in, in winter months. And if we get a bad season with influenza as well, we could have a double whammy in, in, in intensive care. It's not, a, not a bright prospect. <laughs> and on that bombshell. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think there are plenty of reasons to be optimistic, at least for now, because we are at least over the, uh, the peak of the wave um, in uh, most of our countries. Um, and that's the reason to be optimistic for now. Who knows what will happen come the autumn. Thanks very much to everyone for joining us today. Um, we'd better bring it to a close. Just quickly to mention, Charlie, I don't know if you want to give this a plug, your Archem Top 5s. We're really interested in knowing what evidence you've seen out there that's relevant to the COVID pandemic. And you can submit that via a Google form. Yeah, so there's a Google form we're putting out every week on Twitter. We'll put it out again this week. Uh, if you see an interesting paper, uh, then please submit it on this uh, Google form with a little paragraph as to why it's relevant to ED physicians. And we're endeavouring to publish them in the top five. And also, uh, we're putting a lot of them out on the extended blog for Director's Cut, which is available on Arkham Learning and also on the St. Emlyn's blog. So we're really keen for absolutely everyone to get involved. So if you've got any interesting papers, pop them in. Thanks a lot. And so thanks to everybody, especially Celine for joining us at five o'clock in the morning after a twilight <laughs> shift. So superhuman effort. We really appreciate it. Uh, I wouldn't miss hanging out with all of you. Thank you so much for inviting me and, and thank you for everything you guys are doing. All the information you're putting out is making a difference. So thank you to everybody who's out there and stay safe. Oh, and thanks Celine, a lot you too, as always. Celine, have you mentioned Rebel EM? Because you've got a, a huge amount of stuff on the Rebel EM site as well. So yeah. I lost sound there for a second, but tell people about Rebel EM if you haven't already. Of course. So Rebel EM, I didn't want to talk about my own site. I, I, that's not the point. But um, uh, Rebel EM is, is my website, uh, my blog. It's just www.rebelem.com. And much like St. Emlyn's, uh, we try and go through all the literature and try and put out things that will affect practice. We try and go through the evidence-based medicine and most recently, I think what Simon is getting at is we opened up a, a COVID section where I'm just daily, I'm updating papers as they're coming out. And um, there's just tons of information that I hope people find useful. Well, I certainly absolutely do. It's brilliant, Salim. So thanks, thanks very much for all you do. Um, we'll be having another journal club this time next week. We're getting a bit better. Well, I'm getting a bit better at the uh, technical aspects from starting from a low level. So <laughs> we'll get there eventually by the end of the pandemic. I uh, hope you can join us. Um, thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone.